This week on The Real Watch List Plus, we continue our Western series with the iconic comedy Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid from 1969, the original anti-hero movie. Come on, you wanna go for a ride? Get on the handlebars. Hell no! So this week, we're reviewing in our classic Western series, a classic Western. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid from 1969. It's a tongue-in-cheek comedy representative of an anti-hero movie. Let me tell you about the plot. Tell now, me about the plot, Deb. Let's get into it. people don't know the plot of this thing, this... Where have you been living? Yeah, under a rock, Skinner box. So, we Gen went through Z that already. pay attention. You should need to notice. Put it on your list. All right. So here's the plot. In Wyoming in 1890s, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, played by Paul Newman and Robert Redford respectively, lead a band of outlaws named the Notorious Hole in the Wall Gang. When a train robbery gets botched, they find themselves on the run with a posse of federal agents hard on their heels. This actually is based or inspired by a true story. Yes. Uh, we have two characters, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Um, who were after, actually named after um, two real-life people, uh, and I'm getting their names. Help me out, Deb. Butch Cassidy was a butcher in real life, and yes. he'll find his name in the meantime. And the Sundance Kid, I believe he was arrested in Sundance, the town, Correct. so he got the name Sundance. Sundance Kid. So Butch Cassidy uh, was Robert Leroy Parker. Correct. Like you said, he was a butcher, and Harry Alonzo Lagerbach, who, like you said, got arrested name, in Sundance, huh? Wyoming. Yep, some name back then. Um, Alonzo Longabau. It was Longabau. So while the movie and their fate, we won't get into the spoiler alert yet, were fictionalized, um, you know, most of the story is based on their true life right. and their uh, escape to Bolivia. But before we dig any deeper, should we go into our costumes? Yeah, because I think... Our costumes portray this movie, although some people don't know who I'm dressed up as. Well, I didn't, I didn't know. But you're at a place who yes. is the love interest of Sundance Kid. What's also interesting is that we really don't know historically who at a place was. Okay. Some people believe that she could have been a lady of the evening, a prostitute. Some people believe that, you know, in this film, she was portrayed of as a teacher. Yeah, a teacher. I'm Sundance. I'm Robert Redford. Okay, there you go. A very I, handsome I Robert get, Redford. I didn't want to say it. I was getting you too confused. Who? I'm Robert Redford. I thought I was with him, except he looks a little worn out. You look young. So. Oh, well, thank See, you. See, I've got to grease him a little bit every now and then. She's but gonna grease me. I'm gonna grease okay. you. Okay. Well, I'm gonna get. I'll just go over. First of all, Paul Newman fought to get Robert Redford into the film. And it was the film debut also of Sam Elliott, who's big Western guys in all our Western okay, movies. Okay, I'm throwing you a trivia. Okay. And this is, we're gonna do Joe's thing later yeah, with trivia. Yeah, okay, but, am I so like? This was, as you mentioned, Ooh. Sam Elliott, who was known for his Westerns later on after this movie. Yes. His first appearance in a film. Right. What's the connection with Sam Elliott and this film? He married Catherine Ross. <laughs> And you know what else about Catherine Ross that I what? found out? Yes, Mrs. Robinson. Okay. At the time, she was dating cameraman Conrad Hall, who's a big camera guy, and he put her on a camera one day. He so had an extra only, camera. If I may interrupt. Yes. He not only was he a big cameraman, but he was the cameraman, the cinematographer for this film. Correct. That was specifically yes. selected um, by the director. And he was dating her, and he put her on a camera and he, by the director, was scolded and banned. It was an extra camera and her boyfriend did it. She disliked the director after that because he yelled and screamed at her. And also considered for the role was Natalie Wood and Jacqueline Bissett, who were big at the time, especially Jacqueline Bissett, you know, uh, or Bissett or whatever. And the director was George Roy Hill, who also did The Sting, Slapshot, and Slaughterhouse Five. You could ask me a Joe Thang on those three. Okay, how about I ask you one now? George Roy Hill. What about? Was he liked by the industry or disliked by the industry? The film industry, of course, folks. Well, I know he was liked by Paul Newman. I, I think he was, I don't know. Well, from what I researched, I yes. come to find out that he was actually not liked by many people because he had, he had a, um, a higher education. He was, he, he was very well-educated. Okay. Um, 
but he wasn't very personable to people. And on the set, he was very strict with what he wanted. Discussions in, in you know, in some cases where, you know, things like the song in this movie, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, which we'll talk about later. Yes. Robert Redford hated that song, but George wanted that song. He was going to get Correct. that song yep. in. Even mm -hmm. Paul Newman, even though he got along with George Roy Hill, there was, there was an argument. And at the end of the day, George always won the argument. He wasn't one of these directors that kind of conceded to the actor's input. It was his way or... Yeah, but back then they really didn't because it was the studio system still and the studio head executive would put that director in charge and he ran the show. Whereas nowadays, kind of producers have the say-so and they can even fire a director. That's one thing about this film, if you, um, if, as you're watching it, you actually feel the camaraderie between Robert Redford and Paul Newman. You mentioned earlier, I mean, Paul Newman at the time was a well-known and established actor. Um, Robert Redford was kind of new to the scene, um, new. younger. Um, and there was consideration for Steve McQueen to actually yes. play Butch Cassidy and Paul Newman to play the Sundance Kid when it didn't pan out for Steve McQueen. Paul Newman became Butch Cassidy, which he didn't want that role because right. George Roy Hill wanted to be more comedic and there's a lot of comedy in here. Yes. And Newman was like, I'm not, I don't do comedy. That's and McQueen not me. was a bigger star and they had the title changed. It was Sundance Kid and Butch Cassidy. And then they changed it when Newman got in and changed it because he was more popular than Redford. And with George Roy Hill, which is really interesting, if you watch this movie and it starts off, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think that Robert Redford's Sundance is in like a card game or something. The first shot is the close up of his face, so close that you see his eyes and his nose. And no film back then started with an unknown with a close up facial shot. But they did it because it was like completely different and they wanted to do kind of a departure film because this was one of the series in the time period of anti-hero films where you root for the bad guy. Right. You love the bad guy. That's a good point, because you're talking about films prior to that where the good guy's the cowboy, he's going to save the day, he's going to go after the Indians, he's going to have a romantic relationship, and end story. Where here you have this These guys are robbing and killing, on. and yet you love them. Right. You love them. And you feel it. And they, they were so well suited for each other that it came across in the film. Third Ross, she was like the it girl of the time. Yes. She, she represented that 60s kind of Woodstock, flower girl, flower power girl. Um, she was short, 5'3". She was? Yes, she was shorter than us. And I'm short. God, we're so into this movie I and we, know, and we forgot jerks. to do our review. Yeah, so, but... On the count of three, we're gonna flip our review and let the audience know how we review Butch Cassie and the Sundance Kid. This is like role reversal from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Watch that episode, folks. I know. You give it a 10, I give it a 9. In the other movie, I gave it a 10. She gave that a 9. We have to talk about why. You know, you look at it, I look at it in a different way. She means in a better way. No, she's I don't. No, it's not 39 better. 39 years no, in the industry. No, it's not better. 39, screw that. I look at it as when I saw it in a movie theater as to now. Mm -hmm. I, I look at it, what it's done to the culture. I look at it as a standard of a genre. I look at it on so many different levels, which I will explain later, but I want you to talk about the cinematographer. Conrad Hall, as, we, as you mentioned earlier, was dating yes. Catherine Ross. I mean, how does that happen? I mean, mm -hmm. he and George Roy Hill on, his, on their scouting trip, what the hell was that? Wide landscapes. They used a washed out, desaturated color. They overexposed the film to give it that kind of washed out, yellow hue color. And so th again, one of the reasons why this was so unique to the time and breaking away from your typical Westerns. Again, the 60s, breaking away from all these different yeah. traditional genres. Um, and one way they did this, and they were criticized, but then later won an Academy Award, was the music. The music written by Burt Bacharach. He wrote the song, uh, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. And there's the iconic scene 
where Paul Newman, Butch Cassidy, is biking, rides this newfangled contraption, which is called a bicycle. You know, if you don't have time to watch the movie, which we highly recommend, watch that scene because it was so criticized, but so celebrated afterwards um, for the music, for the, for the um, placing us in the movie. Like who would think, it was almost like putting a music video in the middle of a movie because it didn't really fit. It, it fit in the eyes of the director, you know, showing the relationship between Etta Place and Butch Cassidy. And they weren't lovers, but you got this flirtatious thing going on. And Robert Redford, who was still in bed waking up, but it wonderfully captures the beauty of Catherine Ross at the time, that Woodstock flower girl feel. The song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. Yep. Many people didn't want it. Like I said earlier, Robert Redford thought it was a terrible idea. B.J. Thomas sang the song. It won an Oscar, actually two Oscars for, uh, for Backrack, won two Oscars for Best Original Score for the movie and the Best Original Song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. But I don't know if you know, this is a bit of trivia. Yes, I'll I want to know everything. I knew B.J. Thomas. You did? I did. I knew B.J. Thomas. If you know the song, Raindrops Keep Falling yeah, gonna, on My yeah, Head. Yeah, we be singing it. Yeah, you know, I, I, and I, I knew him for a short period of time, but I always wonder, like, you know, having a name like, like BJ, what do you do if someone says, hey, BJ, what do you do? Like, say, uh, are you calling me or are you asking me? And I told BJ after a while that, um, you know, he had a rough go after the, the popularity sort of waned. First of all, where do you know? Tell me how you know him. I know him from back in the day. Yes. It's back in the day. You know, like the 60s, 70s. Oh. You know. And a lot of people at that time, you know, after this song came out and the popularity kind of waned, yeah. people said BJ sucked. Well. But then, you know, after a while he went soft, BJ went soft. What do you mean by And do you know BJ was not only a singer, he was a hummer. You are like going, what are you talking about? Good he, gracious. I'm thinking, you know, you know my mind you know, goes well, to... And I know you know this because you're in the arts. You sang for many years. I still you're do. You're a showgirl. I have a show in September. And you were in theater. You know, yes, it's, totally. appearances are everything. And I used to give BJ a lot of advice. I used to give him a lot of advice. I said, BJ, you better watch your teeth. You know, all right. So let's go back to this. Actually, BJ thought it would ruin his career. But here we come back. I'm, you know, I'm trying to clean this all up. Was and he make hard it... up? What? <laughs> Stop. But because of the radio, these songs became popular. And because, I'm sorry, the monkey chite that's on the radio these days, where you get one good song out of every hundred, this has a tune. I mean, I'm not playing it. I don't have the album or anything or vinyl or whatever. But... I mean, you can hear the song, and most songs are three minutes, so it was great. Three minute song, you know, the whole thing. Start, middle, finish. It has a great tune. One of the things about the end of the movie, and then we'll go into Joe's thing, because it really just like brings it all sure. together. Spoiler alert is the uh, last scene where Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid are trapped by the Boliv Bolivian army. There's this tender scene, as many reviewers call it, yeah. between two men, but it's kind of unheard of in Western or, or movies in general. Okay. Where he's tending to his wound mm -hmm. and he's wrapping, he's reaching over to like help him. And then they realize like, this is it. This is gonna be oh, yeah. the, la the last go. When they come out, shots are fired and the movie freezes. And this, again, they incorporate the animation, so to speak at that time. Um, sepia, the artwork, everything is layered. Joe Stang, the trivia. This is gonna be multiple choice, but I think you're gonna do well in it. Oh, God. So, let me ask you a question. Uh, which one of these actors was not considered for the parts of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? The lead actors, okay? Oh, uh, both leads were yes. going? Okay. So these actors, which one was not considered for either Butch Cassidy or Sundance Kid? Steve McQueen, Jack Lemmon, Sam Elliott, or Warren Beatty? Jack Lemmon, probably. No. Wrong. Get out. Really? Jack Lemmon was considered for Can the part. Can you imagine how weird yep. that would be? Yep. Sam Elliott is the right answer. 
as you mentioned earlier, that's the first. And you always think Sam Elliott because he's because you know first westerns. Yeah, he's right. Mr. Western. But this was his first western. Right. He was too. Oh yeah, I should have thought about that. It was his first movie. What a dodo. Duh. All right. I better drink some more uh, smart Fireball. juice. Fireball. Yeah. There you go. Burt Bacharach, back to Bacharach, won two Oscars for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, best original score and best original song. Which one of these other Bacharach movie songs did he win an Academy Award? There's four choices. One, he won an Academy Award. Okay. Was it 1966, What's New Pussycat, Tom Jones? Was it 1967, Alfie, sung by Cle uh, Celia Black? Later sang by Cher, and then later sang by Dionne Warwick. 1968, Casino Royale, The Look of Love by Dusty Springfield, or... 1982, author, author's theme, The Best That You Can Do, sung by it, Christopher uh, Cross, not Chris Cross, the rappers, but Christopher Cross. Christopher Cross. I'm going to take a wild guess because out of all them, it is a song I've sung one in a million times, one of my signature songs, but I'm probably wrong, and I'll get the ejector seat, or I'll get a shock, or I'll get this thrown in my face, Alfie. <laughs> See, I, I don't care because I love Alfie. I like What's it all about? Alfie, Alfie, is it just for the moment It wasn't live? that. It wasn't the look of love. It wasn't what's new, Pussycat? Casino oh, Royale. It was Arthur's theme. Oh. The best that you can do oh, and is out fall of all in of them, love. I don't think that's the best song out of the four. Well, he won an Academy Award. And as we know from our other episodes, look back, that the Academy Award doesn't always pick the best. Yeah, but at least they had tunes then. And the last one. Oh, Jesus, there's more. Which one of these reviewers on. gave the movie a positive review? Time Magazine, New York Times, Gene Siskel, Robert Ebert. Or, hey, sorry. I'm, I started answering and he cuts me off. Or none of the above. Uh, maybe Roger Ebert. Mm. Oh, Jesus Christ. None of the above. Time Magazine called it a cinematic schizophrenia, a Batman Robin movie, and they hated the song. New York Times said the performers succeeded, although the movie did not, and it had annoying emptiness. Gene Siskel said this was his first negative review and told his ever assistant. Ever in his whole life? His first ever, yes. Well, that's at that probably time. they were just starting their show yeah. like us. Yeah, well, this is before, I think See, it was before he was in the show. we're going to be extremely famous, so we're going to be like them. Yes, and just Gene Siskel said to his assistant, when they said, oh my God, you're, you're, you're going negative, he goes, you can't allow that to change your view and opinion on a movie. There you go. I know you would like I have that. a tidbit that I just saw and I need to say it. And it's, it, this was an inspiration for the TV show Alias Smith and Jones. I don't know if everybody ever heard of it, but it was a cowboy movie when there were cowboy things that were TV, you know, uh, on with Westerns. And the actor who played Smith was Newman's stand-in for Butch Cassidy. And Smith and Jones were also gunslingers in real life, and they knew Butch and Sundance. All these wonderful trivia. And I think yeah, that's what I didn't makes... know that till I did this. I thought it was so cool. It is. Okay, so why should we watch it? I think well, there's several reasons why the cinematography, again, unique for the time, the the washed out scenes, the wide landscapes, um, integrating these montages, uh, and I call it animation. I'm using the wrong word, but it's it's yeah, the, the different mean. type of of um, cuts by using stills and freeze frames right and, and freeze frames yeah. integrate a change in the story um i think the the actors especially paul newman and uh robert redford, redford they created something new well the reason i give it you know and i think people should watch it it is a classic film that everybody when you say the name that has seen it says i love that movie these two guys were at the peak they were hollywood icons their whole lives from when they started in film and it also brought in humor, and it was an unbelievable anti-hero movie, which started the anti-hero movies that came through. That was a genre anti-hero, and it was also a Western biography. So, I mean, it had all those elements. It has all the elements of classic cinema, and that's why I gave it a 10, because it held up in the movies when I saw it when I was young, and I watched it the other day, and I said, yes, a really damn good picture. But they, this is a great watch list. I had so much fun doing it. And this represents all lovable anti-heroes, okay? Number one, one of my favorite pictures in the world. I, I don't know how you're gonna find it, but I'm sure Amazon would sell the DVD because I know somebody bought it for me. 
Uh, Kirk Douglas's favorite movie that he ever did, Lonely or the Brave, 1962. He plays Jack Burns, a cowboy uncomfortable with changes, just like Debbie hates farming changing. Bonnie and Clyde, never fantastic anti-hero movie. I haven't seen movie. that in a long time. The best example of American new wave cinema. It's a true story of bank robbing lovers, which is the best example of new wave American cinema, which was started Jack Nicholson, Warren Beatty, and Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway are at their best. Great film, I could sit and watch it. And Gene Hackman as well, Estelle Parsons won an Oscar. Cool Hand Luke. Ugh, yes. 1967, I mean, talk about Paul Newman and also Strother Martin's in it. 1967, a charming jailbird on the prison chain gang keeps escaping and garnering the admiration and love of his fellow inmates. And also it has a great example of Christ symbolism, which you have to watch it and see that at the end. Hmm. And the sting, we talked oh, about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They both went from Butch Cassidy right into of the sting, George Roy Hill, paired again with Robert Shaw in it as well, who was Quint in Jaws, and it's about a racetrack betting scam. These are ones you got to see if you consider yourself a film person. You have to watch these films. I mean, I haven't, the ones you've named, I've seen, but I haven't seen them in a long time, so I'm excited to see them again. So go out to Amazon, get them, um, add them to your collection, and enjoy yeah. some classic cinemas. So Deb, where are we going next? All I can say is one thing to you, Joe. On the Real Watchers Plus, we never know we're going till we go there.